Uh, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. The book of Mark. We are uh, continuing our series through the book of Mark. It is the second book of the New Testament, right after the book of Matthew and just before the book of Luke. We'll be in chapter 8, Mark chapter 8. Now, uh, several years ago, we uh, as a family sat down to watch a movie that I suspect most of you have watched as well. Uh, I'm guessing you probably watched the Lego movie, right? Y'all remember that one? Y'all, I was seriously blown away by this movie. <laughs> I mean, it was so good. Maybe one of the better, one of the best kids' movies I've ever seen. And so we watched it, and then afterwards, um, I was reflecting on it with Kendra and the kids, and, and Kendra tells me that I, I never fail to use an opportunity to teach a lesson. I'm not really sure what that's about. Um, but I was like, hold on, y'all. I mean, let, let's talk about this a bit, all right? In the Lego movie, we learn of a world that's a bit fallen. It's a bit fallen. Things aren't the way it's supposed to be. Things aren't supposed to be the way they are. And so as the movie goes on, we, we learn it hasn't always been that way. It, there's this city, Bricksburg, and the Lego people in Bricksburg used to live happy lives. They used to live free lives. They, they were able to create like they wanted to create. They were able to interact like they wanted to interact with each other. There was, dare we say, shalom in the land of Lagos. It was peaceful. Dare we say perfect. But then one day, evil comes into the land. Evil. There's this bad man. You remember his name? Lord Business. And he hated the Lego world. And so he decided to destroy it. He brought destruction and he built walls around the different Lego lands. And now all the people in Lego land live in fear. But, but there existed a prophecy among the people. A prophecy. And this prophecy said that one day there would be a Lego that would be called the special. And this Lego would be so important. He would be the most talented, the most interesting, most extraordinary person in the universe. And this person would one day overthrow that evil, the evil Lord business, and restore things back to their natural harmony. Enter an ordinary construction worker by the name of Emmett, whom nobody would have suspected to ultimately turn out to be the special or, or the one to fulfill the prophecy. He leads this band of misfit master builders against Lord Business, and ultimately, the way that he would defeat evil is by sacrificing himself for his friends. I mean, that's powerful. That's a great story. And at this point, as I'm talking through the plot, one of the kids goes, hey, that sounds like, and you could see the light bulb go on top of their heads. Boom. And so at this point, I'm looking at Kendra, she's peeking at me, and I'm thinking, oh, we are good. I mean, we, we are good at this. Man, we are killing this parenting thing. Our kids get it. I mean, y'all need somebody to teach a parenting class? We are available. And so we return back to the light bulb and our moment of glory. And they say, that sounds like the movie Frozen! He who has ears to hear, let him hear. <laughs> Y'all remember that? Maybe not. 
It, it isn't a perfect illustration for our text today, but, but I think it helps bring light to the fact that there are people who just don't get it. Right? There are people, there are some that just don't get it. We sometimes don't see what should be seen. We don't hear what should be heard. We don't understand what should be understood. And so we come to a small, almost peculiar section in the book of Mark where Jesus encounters two groups of people who just don't get it. And we see his fascinating responses to both groups. And then ultimately, because of the illumination of the Holy Spirit and because of what we know of the person and work of Jesus Christ, we're going to see and proclaim that Jesus and Jesus alone has the power to overcome our spiritual blindness and open our eyes so that we might see. We saw Jesus' response to a different group last week in the first 10 verses of the chapter in the feeding of the 4,000 to a group that Mitch reminded us last week was made up mostly of Gentiles, who if you remember in verse 1, if you look in verse 1, in those days when a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him. If you remember, they were hungry. They had nothing to eat. And if you look at verse 2, do you remember how Jesus responded? Verse 2, he says, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. That's his response. He has compassion. We saw that Jesus cared for these people. We saw him provide for the people. And we saw him satisfy and meet the needs of the people. He, he has compassion for them. Compassion. Oh, Lord, make me a compassionate man. Make me compassionate like your son. That's a big prayer. That seems to be a missing component in our world today, even sometimes among the church. He had compassion for them. Which brings us to our text today. And another group that Jesus is about to encounter. The first of two that we'll see. Let's pick it up in verse 11. We're in chapter 8, verse 11. It says this. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat, and went to the other side. He, here's the first thing we see. We see that there are some who refuse to see. There are some who refuse to see. Some people don't get it, and they don't get it because they refuse to get it. Right after feeding the Gentile crowd of 4,000, we see in verse 10 that he got into the boat with the disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha, which was a seaside town on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. And it was there that he encounters our first group. It's this group of Pharisees. It's almost an abrupt encounter. They kind of come out of nowhere. And we've seen this group of Pharisees before, most recently in chapter 7. Uh, when Mitch preached a, a few weeks ago on the traditions and commandments of this group of religious elitists. And so now we see them again, and they seem to be a bit angry with Jesus. Maybe because they're still upset about Jesus calling them out, calling them hypocrites. We don't know. Not too sure. But we see a few things that happen here. The first is that they test him. Verse 11, Pharisees came, began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. They test him. That word could also be interpreted as tempt. They tempt him. You'll recall in Matthew 4 when Satan attempts to tempt Jesus while in the wilderness. Mark perhaps might be suggesting that the Pharisees here were in the same league with Satan. In fact, on two occasions in the Gospels, uh, the Pharisees are referred to as a brood of vipers or sons of the devil. 
on two occasions, one, one by John the Baptist and the other by Jesus. Brood of vipers. Mm. They want to see a sign from heaven. They want Jesus to prove his divine authority by doing something miraculous. But here's the thing. He's kind of been doing that a lot. Considering how many miracles Jesus has already performed, particularly in the first few chapters of Mark, it's easy to conclude that the Pharisees aren't really all that interested in Jesus taking the opportunity to prove his divinity. Back in chapter 3, Jesus heals a man with a withered hand, and what did the Pharisees do? It says they went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. They're not like, wow, look at this guy. No, they want to destroy him. They look for a reason to accuse Jesus. And that's their intention here. That's their intention. They aren't there to listen to Jesus. They're not there to see his wonderful works or to consider whether he was actually the person that he claimed to be. They're there to find a reason not to believe in Jesus, not to believe in him. They test him. The next thing that happens is that they bring the Lord grief. Look at verse 12. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. You may, may remember two weeks ago in our text when Jesus sighed as he healed a man who was deaf. This time, his deep sigh is one coated in anguish. <sighs> I mean, Jesus is a human. They've provoked his irritation. He's irritated. They, they've already received plenty of proof of the source of his power. And now they come to him trying to check his ID. Trying to check his credentials. It would be a bit like asking Michael Jordan to prove his worth on the court by asking him to hit another game-winning shot. Come on, Jordan. Let's we'll see what you got. Hit this one and then I'll really believe. Or, or maybe like uh, asking Picasso to see his portfolio, to see if he's worthy enough to teach your kids art. Let's we'll see what you got. Or maybe like asking Chuck Norris if he knows what a Texas Ranger is. I mean, there's only one Walker Texas Ranger. And some of y'all don't get that, and shame. At some point, there's nothing more to prove. You, you stop playing games with those asking for proof. Jesus says, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. I don't dig, do big fancy miracles in order to try and convince people like you, Pharisees. If you can't see God at work in me, then nothing will convince you otherwise. I ain't playing your evil and wicked game. Then what happens? Look at verse 13. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. They test Jesus. They grieve Jesus. And then in a sobering verse, Jesus leaves them. There's really nothing more to be said. It, it, it appears to be a sign of divine judgment, which is ironic because they were just looking for a sign. These religious zealots were so physically close to Jesus, yet so spiritually far from him. They don't have eyes to see, nor ears to hear. Uh, some of us today might say, gosh, if, if I could only see a miracle, then, then I'd believe. No, you wouldn't. We don't need a miracle to see. We, we need new hearts. We need to be given new hearts. Some don't have eyes to see or ears to hear because their hearts are hardened. Uh, one commentator writes this. He asks, 
What is it that blinds these Pharisees? Is it Jesus' unconventional behavior? Uh, or maybe they're concerned to preserve their own power and status, their constipated faith, or their skepticism that God would work in such an enigmatic fashion, or their desire that God destroy Gentiles and not feed them, their wish to embarrass Jesus when he fails to produce such a sign. Jesus says that false prophets and false Christs will give signs and wonders to deceive. But Jesus will offer this generation no noisy sign from heaven, only the wind whistling through an empty tomb after his crucifixion. Ain't nobody there, y'all. Ain't nobody in that tomb. Listen. True faith doesn't keep asking for signs. True faith doesn't demand Jesus to prove himself. True faith takes God at his word. True faith looks at what God has already done. And true faith is satisfied with the bread that he gives us. True faith doesn't demand more, 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 but rather just like the Gentile 4,000, sees that Jesus cares, that he provides for them, and that he sees that the bread of life satisfies our needs. Church, we have all the proof we need. If you're sitting in here, I need more proof. We've got the proof. His word provides it. Not to mention, the biggest miracle of all is still to come. At the end of Mark, we're going to see an empty tomb. My goodness gracious. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Which brings us to our second group of people this morning. This next group, hopefully, brings a little more encouragement, though it might be difficult to see. We've learned that there are some who refuse to see. Now we learn that there are some who fail to see. There are some who fail to see. Again, some just don't get it. Look at verse 14. Verse 14. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, they being the disciples, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and leaven of the Herod, leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear, and do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, twelve. And the seven for the four thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Well, the Pharisees weren't the only ones who didn't understand or who had hardened hearts or couldn't spiritually see or hear, but something's different about this next group. The the scene opens with, with Jesus back on the boat, crossing to the east side of the Sea of Galilee, And he's on the boat with the second group, his disciples. The the disciples who've seen all the miracles, they've heard all the teachings, but still appear to be remarkably clueless. Now, mind you, they've just fed multitudes. They've gotten some up-close-and-personal time on the water with Jesus. But it doesn't appear yet that they are fully grasping the reality of who Jesus is. Because there's an argument brewing aboard the boat. The boys are being boys, and they are going at it. They're having quite the big discussion. And the subject under discussion is bread. Bread. Verse 14 is a bit unusual. They, They got in a boat, forgot to bring bread, and had only one loaf. Well, that's a weird clunky verse. Well, which is it? Do they forget to bring bread, or do they have a loaf? Did they know they had a loaf? Who knows? The point is, somebody forgot to pack the lunch. They have one loaf for their journey, and that's not going to cut it. 
And it's not like you can miraculous, miraculously turn one loaf into several. How, how would that happen? Not with a short memory like theirs. And so they're going to get hungry. And you know what happens when you get hungry? You get hangry. Right? Whose fault is this? Who didn't bring the bread? Somebody's got to pay. Well, they forgot who was in the boat. They forgot about what that person can do. A few years ago, we were in uh, San Francisco, which is my favorite city in the world. I know, I know. And uh, we're walking down the waterfront near Fisherman's Wharf, having a grand old time, and then it hits us. Sourdough. Sourdough. Oh, that smelled so good. We, we came upon this bread factory called Bodine Bakery. Spelled Bodan, but pr pronounced Bodine on the West Coast. Okay. Bodine fact Bread Factory, the oldest sourdough bread factory in the country. And oh, it smelled so good. So we walk up to this huge window right on the street, and behind the window was this large room filled with workers and several machines churning out bread. Bread, bread, bread. It was glorious. And all I can think of, standing there, looking through that window, was, man, if I only had a room like this at the house. <laughs> I'd be 300 pounds, I'm sure. The disciples are on that boat in a bit of a predicament because they've forgotten to bring some lunch. And yet there is a bread-making uh, machine literally in their midst. Jesus has multiplied bread on two occasions. He's fed over 10,000 people, but that apparently has made little impression on them. I'd imagine these disciples walking in San Francisco with a map, trying to find something to eat, wondering where they're going to find some lunch, completely bypassing the boating factory. There's a spiritual lesson here for us. They are physically so close to the bread of life, just like the Pharisees were, but with dull minds, blind eyes, and deaf ears. I, uh, I was at home the other night putting this together, and I was thinking through this illustration, and I go, hey, hey, y'all remember that bread factory we ate at in San Francisco? And one of the kids said, yeah, the one that I hated? <laughs> Some of us just don't get it, y'all. But him who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so what Jesus says next in verse 15 almost seems out of place. It's kind of like, like verse 16 would float naturally after verse 14, without even the need for, for verse 15. And so verse 15 seems like it breaks this connection between 14 and 16, right? So if you read 16 right after 14, you'd go right on with the story. But what we find in verse 15 is a warning. Jesus has something to tell his disciples once he realizes there's a discussion about bread going on. He says this, and he cautioned them, saying, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Okay, Jesus. That's a bit of a mysterious statement. They may have had no idea what he meant since they go right back to discussing the fact that they had no bread. But this warning tells us there's some danger in their worry about a bread shortage. Jesus warns his disciples to watch out for the leaven. You might have the word yeast, which is probably helpful in understanding what he's saying here. You might have the word yeast. Leaven was used to make bread rise. And leaven provided a strong religious message for Jews in the first century. So during Passover, all Israel would eat unleavened bread. And that was to remind them of their really quick exit from Egypt since their bread hadn't had time to rise. By the time of Jesus' day, leaven had become this powerful symbol that indicated some kind of impurity. 
It, it symbolized corruption and the infectious power of evil. If, if Lord Business had something favorite, he'd love leaven. It, it represented an ingredient that watered down something that had originally been pure. It could spread poison and infect the next batch of dough. And so Jesus is warning them, careful, careful. Watch out for the leaven. Now Jesus didn't say beware a whole lot. So when he did, when he did, it was important. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. He saw how both parties of the Pharisees and of Herod's party and his friends and his followers how they were dangerously corrupting God's message. Even if it seemed like a small corruption, it was still dangerous. Uh, the Pharisees, will remember, are a bunch of religious hypocrites. They are legalistic. Mitch preached on this a few weeks ago back in chapter 7. They've, they've added so many regulations to God's law that its original intent had been blocked. On the other hand, we have Herod, who is kind of a puppet king. And he was hoisted up by his followers, the Romans, so that they can rule over the Jews. And Herod was this notoriously violent and hopelessly immoral ruler. He was anything but a true king. If the Pharisees were a legalistic religious bunch, well, Herod and his people were a, a, a licentious, irreligious bunch. And these are the two extremes that we sinners, even in the church, find ourselves swinging between on this great spiritual pendulum of life. If we're not careful, we can find ourselves swinging between these two poles. Some of us can preoccupy ourselves with, with minor details or, or, or biblical intricacies that can trap us in a legalistic mindset that ultimately lead us away from a message love, of love that stands at the heart of the Bible. And like Mitch mentioned a few weeks ago, there's something almost admirable about that, right? We, we admire how zealous the Pharisees are, how committed to truth they are. But according to Jesus, they are whitewashed tombs. They are hypocrites who replace God's truth for their own truth. Then there's other, others of us who try to make the gospel more likable for the modern-day audience. We do that by diluting Jesus' message of repentance and faith. And in this case, listeners often become enamored with the messenger instead of the actual message. Give us our Herod. He's so smooth. I love the way that he makes me feel. But all that ever results is corrupt church systems that nowhere resemble the church that Jesus built. Jesus warns against either camp. The more we add to Jesus' gospel message, the more we subtract from its original purpose. And the more we dumb down the message in order to tickle listeners' ears, then the greater impurity grows. Holiness will go out the window. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Listen, church, if we give either legalism or license an inch, I guarantee you will take it. They will take a mile. That's why Jesus says to watch out for them. Watch out. Beware. Watch out for those who are altering God's message. Watch out for those who are leading others astray. This is a message for all of us. We've got to beware of leaven. Now, I, um, this is safe space for me, right? I can confess things. I have a tendency to gravitate towards one of these particular leavens. Like I think we all do. I think we go, we can go here, we go there. We have a tendency to go either way. I've noticed in my life, I can be easily lured by the leaven of the Pharisees. I can think particularly in my late 20s, early 30s. Oh, this was a huge issue for me. Being so trapped in a legalistic mindset that frankly I'm surprised God has chosen to sustain me. And really, I was quite blind. You know why this leaven is so dangerous? Uh, because you don't see it coming. Uh, I remember reading a book called Accidental Pharisees. 
And the author is describing the process of becoming a Pharisee, becoming legalistic. And he says that this process of becoming a Pharisee is a lot like going to Denny's. Nobody plans on going there. You just kind of end up there. (laughs) And I apologize if you're a fan of Denny's or are affiliated with them somehow, if you own stock or something. My intention isn't to shame. But nobody wakes up one day and thinks, today, I'm going to become a Pharisee. No, it's not what happens. Over time, kernels of of self-righteousness enter our hearts and our mindsets begin to be infected. And for me, for me personally, this fleshes out by me being a lot like the older brother in the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, The older brother upset because we're celebrating the reconciliation of someone who doesn't deserve it. Why celebrate him? He didn't live a right life. I do. If I had a cash to be for me. For me, salvation was for a right type of person. Uh, I was a lot like Jonah. You, you want to save those people, God? No, not them. And ultimately, what this leaven did in me is it would lead me to be so quick to be the judge of the salvation of other people. Uh, I would place these extra biblical filters on the lives of others to determine if they were in or if they were out. And, And it would lead me to this belief that Jesus, in fact, came for the righteous and not for the sick. The exact opposite of what Mark led us through earlier. That he came to seek and save the lost. It's the exact opposite of why he came. I mean, I'm getting sick with myself just thinking about this. And this really came to a head several years ago with my dad. Uh, Last time I told you about my mother dying, this this time my dad. Um, My dad, for as long as we were on earth together, was the most hostile to Christianity person I ever knew. He would mock me for my faith, and my mom and my sisters for her faith and their faith. And, and honestly, with his influence, I, I had quite the spiritual crisis in, uh, in high school, which is another story for another day. Um, on, on top of all that, um, my dad made a lot of unwise decisions, and I'll be frankly honest, was just not a good guy. And he loved to eat at Denny's, too. Um, he, he died four years ago last month. And, and so the day after he died, I fly back home to California. And a few days after my sisters and I are in the church we grew up in, we're, we're in the pastor's office, planning the funeral, you know, talking through the order of, of the service and, and those things. And uh, the pastor stops in the middle of the meeting, and he, he leans in. And he's like, hey, so I, I've got to tell you something. Um... And he looks straight at me and he goes, "Um, two weeks ago, I visited your dad in the hospital. And uh, I led your dad to Christ. And all I can think about in that moment was, no, you didn't. Mm-mm. That's not what happened. Because you don't know what kind of man my dad was. You don't know all the pain that he caused, the abuse, the sleepless nights that he caused my mom, the times that she had to go get him from jail. When in fact he did know all those things because he's a pastor and pastors know your business. But my belief was that God didn't save people like my dad. That he saves only people who are worthy of being saved. You know, good people. People who live good, unmessy lives. You see, in that moment, I was a disciple of Jesus who just didn't get it. 
I was someone who failed to see a Jesus who has the power to overcome spiritual blindness. Even for a man 65 on his deathbed. Even for those of us who don't think that's fair. Well, in the following weeks, man, I'll, I'll tell you what, the Spirit did a work on me. He did work on me. He reminded me that his saving arm is not short. That he didn't come to seek and save a certain type of person, but any and all who repent from sin and place faith in him. And I mean any and all. What the leaven of the Pharisees does to me is it makes me like the older brother in Luke 15 in the parable of the prodigal son, standing outside on the porch with my arms folded while everybody else is inside celebrating the fact that the younger brothers come home. Mm Mm-mm. And that's what it is for me, an evidence of unbelief. And the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod is an evidence of unbelief. Beware. Some of us just don't get it. We've got to be careful of the leaven. And so if you were asking me today, hey, where's your dad? I'll tell you I'm not really sure, but I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful he's with Jesus right now. I'd say I'm now a lot like the father in the next chapter in Mark 9 who says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Which brings me to our last point. There are some who refuse to see. There are some who fail to see. And so we must come to Jesus with our need. We must come to Jesus with our need. Jesus' reference to the leaven is symbolic. But the disciples miss the symbolism. You, you see in verse 16, they go right back to discussing bread. They've missed it. Their worry about their next meal makes them so deaf to the warning Jesus just gave them. And so Jesus then sounds like a parent who's irritated with his kids, but if we think he's irritated because they're, they aren't understanding, well, then we might be missing it too. You can see it in his questions. Look at the questions. You'll see them starting in verse 17. Why are you discussing that you don't have any bread? Don't you perceive or understand? Is your heart hardened? Do you have eyes and not see? Do you have ears and not hear? Don't you remember? That's what we're doing when we're breaking bread together with y'all. Remembering. Man, what you said, your, your first time doing it with us, family, oh, that's meaningful. When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of bread did you collect? When I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of bread did you collect? Don't you understand yet? The questions are key. It doesn't appear that Jesus is upset about the missing bread or upset because they've misunderstood him. The questions bring to light that Jesus is upset, that when faced with a need, the disciples look to themselves instead of turning to him. Hey guys, were you sleeping when I made 10,000 loaves of bread? Don't you think I could do the same thing now? They're behaving as if Jesus is powerless to help them. In the instance of the Pharisees earlier, they operate by having a wrong kind of faith, demanding signs. And here, the disciples operate by having an absence of faith. Faith isn't even there. Did you see all the baskets left over? Don't you see I can provide more than you'll ever need? Why turn inward on yourselves and blame each other? Turn to me. Jesus says to beware of the bread of the Pharisees and beware of the bread of Herod because he wants us to find our bread in him. To find, in fact, that he is our bread. When we seek the better way of the bread of life, we begin to see that what appears to be polar opposites in the Pharisees and and, and of Herod aren't so opposite at all. They're the same thing. It's unbelief. Both irreligion and religion are fundamentally self-salvation projects. The very kind of unbelief that Jesus warns us against. 
True faith instead fixes our eyes on Jesus. These questions that Jesus asks his disciples are not intended to shame. They are intended to instruct, and they instruct us. The disciples might be slow learners, but then so are we. This text really does its work when instead of saying, wow, man, how could the disciples be so blind, so dense? It, it works when we instead ask those questions of ourselves. How, how am I being so blind? How am I dense? How am I not getting it? What leaven are we being susceptible to? What is it that we aren't trusting Jesus in faith? What is it that we are completely trying to accomplish on our own? They don't get it, and often neither do we. But look at that last question in verse 21, and we'll end here. Look at that last question in verse 21. Do you not yet understand? Yet. That yet is hopeful. I mean, those are words that I read in Scripture that get me going. Yet. They haven't fully understood who Jesus is. Yet. They have not understood, but they will if they keep following Jesus. If they stay away from that leaven. That's hopeful. But what they need is divine illumination. Not mortal self salvation. And so do we. A, a, a couple weeks after my dad's funeral, I was speaking on the phone with, with the pastor back home. And, um, I, and I asked him, hey, um, you know, when you, when you last visited him in the hospital, did, did he say anything? I don't know why I didn't ask him earlier, but I really wanted to know if he said anything. And he said, you know, it, was, it wasn't much of a conversation. You know, he was on his deathbed. He didn't say a whole lot. But he said that he, he told my dad about the glory and the riches that are found in Christ and uh, that because of Christ's sinless life and his death on a cross and then his resurrection from the tomb, that because all that, Christ has made a way for my dad to be reconciled back to God the Father. And in order to be reconciled, and enter into an eternal heavenly life, my dad would have to place faith and trust in Christ for the forgiveness of his sins. And he said that my dad rolled over and looked at him and said, um, okay, I want to do that, but I'm really going to need some help. That's it. We come to Jesus with our need and ask for help that only he can fully and abundantly provide. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We are grateful for promises that are made and uh, grateful for promises that are kept, that you keep, and promises that await us in future glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the standing we have with God by virtue of your righteous life and your work and your substitutionary death. And it is that death uh, and, and your resurrection and your promise to return that we so desperately need help to believe and help to think about every day we need help. We pray that you would help us listen when you speak, that, that you would help us find rest when we are troubled, and that you would help us find understanding when we are so clueless and still don't get it, when we're stubborn. Help us to see you, God. And any, anybody who is in here or listening that, that is refusing to see, open eyes, open eyes, God, open hearts, open ears. You have the power to do that, to unblind blind eyes so that we might revel in the beauty of the glorious excellencies of your riches and grace. We pray this in the name of your son Jesus. Amen.